This is Andrew Schwab from Project 86, and you're listening to Discography Discussion. Good evening, sir. Hey, guys. How's it going? We got a whole crew here. Yeah, oh, we're yeah. Uh, the triplets. How are we doing? Yeah, sometimes we can't get people to talk to us, so we uh, we have to bring our own dudes. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta fill the dead space. Yeah, absolutely. Where are you guys located? In St. Louis. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, Likewise, for thanks sure. for coming on. We appreciate it. If you come to St. Louis, just uh, watch your van. People like to steal equipment here. He's aware. He's been to St. Louis <laughs> a few times. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're known for, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. And if your heroes are alive and well, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, you can find everything Discography Discussion at DiscussMetal.com. We are on Google Play. We are on iTunes. We are on Stitcher. We are on TuneIn Radio. So if you have an Amazon Echo product, you can say to it, Alexa, play the latest episode of Discography Discussion, and she will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out and it lets us know you're listening. Our guest this week is Andrew Schwab from Project 86. Right on. Well, you got a whole studio set up here, huh? Yeah, we uh, we used to record music in it, but uh, it has been uh, translated into what, it, what you see now. Podcasting's a real industry. Music is not... Yeah, we realized that, I guess, what, about 10 years ago? <laughs> Something like yeah. that? Well, I was in denial for about five of it. I wish I was joking. <laughs> no, I hear you, <laughs> for sure. Um, let's. I guess we should introduce ourselves, because he's like, I'm trying to be cool to these total strangers here. Um, I'm Dan. I'm the guy that's been emailing you all week. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, Good to meet you, man. I'm Jeff. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? I'm Joe, down in front. <laughs> Joe, how you doing? You're doing... Are you... Pushing the buttons? I'm pushing all the buttons, turning all the dials, and making everybody look and sound as pretty as possible. Got it. Can you hear us okay? Yeah, it's great. Then I feel like I've done my job. <laughs> this, is, this is a podcast, right? Yes, sir. You're not, we're not, okay. we, you're not live somewhere. Okay. You know. Just making sure. Yeah, pants aren't mandatory, so, you know, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you have no idea what's going on under this line. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, All right, let's take bets. Twenty dollars. Right. No. <laughs> so, um, so this doesn't get awkward. Um, anytime I've ever referred to you in the past, I've always just referred to you as Schwab. Do you want to be called Schwab or just Andrew? A lot of people call me that. Um, it's funny because that would imply that, like, I know that person because it's more of a nickname. But that is so common in project 86 them right for people to call me that uh yeah sure man Whatever it's up to push, you. yeah but. it's up to you man it's not a not a big thing we uh sir schwab how about that sir <laughs> schwab. <laughs> schwab the great and powerful i have been toying with the idea of introducing you on the show to the theme of the 2001 space odyssey ladies and gentlemen sir schwab right <laughs> do it that sounds um, awesome. <laughs> so yeah, we were um, we've been uh, we've been big Project Eighty Six fans forever, um, except maybe this guy. But uh, <laughs> oh, you a hater? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a hater. I'm. I just. I spend most of my time uh, listening to metal from Europe. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Feel you on that. But yeah, me and Joe, on the other hand, have been like, I guess, on the bandwagon since what? Joe, uh, well, like two thousand, I guess. In 2000, a certain lead singer who happens to be my brother played a song for me that was called One Armed Man, Play On. Yeah. From, from the very beginning, it was one of those, uh, we, had a, we had a very short list of people that we wanted to talk to, and you were kind enough to respond to us. <laughs> yeah, man, no problem. And thanks for the support and the love, guys. Yeah, for sure, man. We, uh, awesome. Yeah, big, big fans. So. <laughs> hey, man. So um, what made you want to talk about the Mars Volta? Oh, you know, I was going through my iTunes and I was like, okay, these guys want rock and like rock music is over, right? <laughs> For <laughs> so, sure. Yeah. yeah. For now. <laughs> like, uh, I wish I was joking about that one too. Uh, 
so I'm just like, who do I want to talk about? Who would be fun to talk about? Who do I know enough about that I would be passionate enough to have opinions on for to fill, you know, a podcast? And so I was going through, and I made it all the way to M before I found anything I wanted to talk about. And I was like, oh, the Mars Volta. There you go. Perfect. They're also broken up, so that's that's even better. Right. Well, see, I was joking with him that uh, you were going to pick something like Nine Inch Nails or Marilyn Manson. That's too obvious, though. But that was too obvious, so I made that foolish decision to be like, he's going to pick one of those, and i got to go stock up, and then it was Mars Volta. Yes! No, I mean, I was truthfully going to pick Lana Del Rey, but you guys don't want to talk about Lana Del Rey. <sighs> It would. I don't know how different my day would have been necessarily. <laughs> I, I I listened to all of actually all of the Mars Volta albums today because I had, I only had I think the first three. Okay. And um, so I had kind of, but I was actually really surprised uh, when I got to the end that it, it had stayed consistent throughout. Um, that was kind of that was kind of a surprise for me because I kind of I guess over time I just started moving more towards heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier stuff and it. Uh, it just kind of got lost in the shuffle. Yeah, I uh, I picked them because um, not because I'm passionate about their entire catalog. Truthfully, I'm not super familiar with some of their mid catalog stuff. But the stuff that I am passionate about, I'm really passionate about, and I have a lot of opinions and thoughts and interesting. Um, I don't know stories, but. Uh, there, De Laust is one of my favorite records of the last 15 years. Um, De Laust in the Comatorium. And so uh, I could talk about that record for quite a while. Um, yeah, I just picked them because uh, they're, they're an interesting band. They get it in terms of the role of perception and mystique in, in rock and roll. And I think a lot of bands don't... don't um, give much credence to that anymore even though they're a band that's broken up i think for even the time that they came out they sort of went about their perception of their art in, in a way that i relate to and in a way that i would always want to choose to not necessarily emulate but but that's the category of art that that re- i relate to a lot um and just there was so much um just richness to all of their albums um so creative so you know musically speaking all over the map but um they were always trying to challenge themselves to do something you know that was more wacky than the previous stuff and uh, when they were on they were really on but there was a lot of moments throughout those records especially those middle records where they were off insofar as they were just being so weird that it just wasn't listenable it didn't connect Um, yeah yeah, so I'm giving you sort of the grand overview of why I picked them, though, um, mainly because um, the first two records really, really were important to me, and then some songs after that are still in rotation for me every now and then. Definitely, uh, definitely feel you on that first one because the first record, because so, so I was a huge at the drive-in fan, um, as as was beforehand. I beforehand. Um, and I liked, uh, obviously I like Sparta too, the, and, um, and just that kind of sound, um, while not necessarily being super unique in those bands, I mean, and that they were kind of the most unique as far as like what actually got out there, you know, they made it all the way to St. Louis, you know? <laughs> and, right. um, so whenever I, so I, the first one I heard after at the drive-in split basically was, uh, I heard Sparta first, which that essentially sounded like at the drive-in you know um and the mars volta i don't think i was completely ready for it (laughs) like when i when i put in deloused for the first time i kind of didn't know what to expect i knew cedric was singing for him and uh you know i love his voice and and all that and i just I, i was completely floored at the absolute extremes that they went to um, to really to separate themselves from pretty much everything that they had done as musicians before that, um, especially like just hearing Cedric's voice go so above and beyond, because um, I'm predominantly a singer, so I really focus in on the on the vocal side of it, and he um, he just I mean I couldn't I couldn't like when all my friends were were toting stuff like you know 
like Coheed and Cambria for like how you know <laughs> crazy and you know uh, crazy his voice on and stuff. I was like, I don't know, man. You really need to listen to this Mars Volta band because um, this guy is just insane. <laughs> well, I remember you played this for me first because I think they had a new album out, mm-hmm. and I don't remember which record it was, but. The story that I got out of you was this record has Flea playing bass on all the songs. The band improvises all their live shows, and their newest record they had recorded essentially live and just, and it might have been Francis the Mute. They just, they had recorded it live and improvised it, and so every time you go see him, it was different. And I thought, well, that can either be really, really interesting or really, really dumb. <laughs> I think it would depend on how well the uh, bandmates gel. Whenever you, when you get something like that, I think they've done. Uh, I think they proved that they gel because it's been uh, pretty impressive. Yeah, I was kind of kind of surprised to see the uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers connection. I didn't realize that at first. I know John Frusciante actually uh, toured with them for a little bit in support uh, and played played shows with them on stage. You know, not as like as an opener, but actually on stage with them. Mm. But yeah, that that f- the first album. Yeah, I mean, I was, it was hook, line, and singer for me, man. I, it's his voice. I mean, the, the arrangements are really, really cool, too. I mean, I, I really, you can really tell that, you know, somebody put a lot of thought into it. It's not just uh, your, your run of the mill, you know, with, with a crazy vocalist behind it. There's, you know, it's uh, something you can listen to over and over again, and you're going to find little nuances that you probably missed the, the previous listen. And I really like that with with music in general. I mean, I, I kind of sound like a broken record on some of these podcasts, but that's but that's but that's but that's but that's. I got to be able to listen to cover to cover and and enjoy it all the way through. And, and the, you want to talk about a uh, a rookie effort, man? That that this that's one of it's one of the like you said it's probably one of the best albums of the last fifteen years. It's it's really 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 good. Yeah, uh, the thing about De Laos and there's there's so many again layers um to talk about with that particular record um i i think it is a pretty timeless album because i think if it were to to drop today it would still be just as cool from a production standpoint it'd be just as interesting to listen to um there there's so much to absorb from part to part and moment to moment and yeah the dynamics are incredible um I want to talk about just like the production side of it. Sure. Yeah, go for it. So, was Rick Rubin was the producer and uh, Omar and Cedric are, especially Omar, these sort of creative types that are like, it was probably difficult to make that record because they are the type of guys that want to produce themselves and want, don't want anyone else to be speaking into the process. And if you've ever listened to anything that Rick Rubin has put his hands on, it's always pretty simple. Like the way that he approaches you know, songs and song structures and sounds, everything is very in your face as far as the production. Um, there's not as much nuance to it as there is. It's just like, Rick Rubin knows how to make great records that a lot of people connect with, and he's proven it over decades. And if you listen to De Laust and then compare that to Francis the Mute, um, it almost seems like you know the band was so frustrated by being reined in by Rick Rubin that they just went the complete opposite direction because there's no real songs besides the widow on that second album it's all like noise uh, (laughs) movements and it's supposed to be one piece and it's like tracks are 12 minutes long with eight minutes of interlude and sounds and things like that the thing that makes delouse listenable is that they're all standalone good songs with good choruses and good verses and they're all structured in the same way it's verse chorus verse chorus bridge chorus or some version of that formula which there's a reason why producers try to rein you into that formula because um the listener can relate to it and follow it and so you know for after the Laust, i feel like when they decided they wanted to write just a song that had a really good chorus they did it really well but they would only do it once a record or once every other record later on and but if you listen to tracks like like Teflon, which is, you know, on one of their last releases. Um, 
that's a really straightforward like rock song with a really great chorus um but they only chose to do it once on that album <laughs> you know right yeah the widow is the song on the second album on francis the mute you know which also has a lot of great moments but it's not as coherent as delau so you know i really feel like rick rubin had a lot to do with why people love that first album i really do yeah it's a little confusing to me because the big names that come to mind for me when I think of what a Rick Rubin produced record sounds like, most recent example, unfortunately, is Metallica. Then there's System of a Down, there was Johnny Cash, the American recordings, and then all the hip hop he did in the late 80s and early 90s. Hey, you forgot to mention Slayer. I did not forget Slayer. I was getting there. Thank you, sir. <laughs> They're all very flat. It's all turn it up to nine or ten and just that's where the dynamic sits but then this record there's dynamics all over the place there's layers and i wonder did they just give him so much sound that he couldn't put a clench on it because isn't he notorious for for you mentioned reeling it in isn't he notorious for saying take it back to basics and just stick to that because there's a lot going on on deloused i've never worked with him uh I, I think just from talking to people who have worked with him, like he is really zen and kind of just wants the artist to do their thing and to feel comfortable. But um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, he's about songs because that's what you have to be about if you're going to make big rock records that sell. Um, I think that songwriting is what makes it so dynamic. And I just think that he ran with what, you know, they were rolling with there. Um, I would have been really curious to hear some of these songs before they got trimmed, you know, because I guarantee every one of them was probably twice as long and had eight more parts going on. And, you know, if he was doing his job, what he did was he said, okay, let's pick these four parts or these, however many parts, these are the best parts and let's assemble these. And that will be the song. Right. Um, the thing now from a lyric slash thematic standpoint, um, I want to get my hand my hands on this because I've never seen it, but they released a limited edition like graphic novel that went along with the album um, that sort of you know captured you know the story that was supposed to be told. Are you guys familiar with kind of the the story of that album? The most that I've I've picked up is that it is about the suicide of an artist, um, and I could be completely off base on that, but that's. I probably read that in a press release, like when the album came out. So, um, and as much as I think I like to know lyrics, I found the lyrics to be a little incomprehensible. Oh, of course. You know, not yeah. as much on They're this album, but oh my god, on the next ones, like it got yeah. out of control. But yeah, um, as far as I know, it's like supposed to be the suicide of an artist who was like friends with Cedric. Unless I'm thinking of the wrong record, but um, I know it's supposed to be like a like a journey. Um, like I don't like right before the moments of death. Am I wrong about that? Well, it sounds like it sounds like you know. So. <laughs> this was the gist of it, as from what I remember. Uh, yeah, they had a friend who was, you know, I guess, close with the band, and he, I think he was a drug addict. But um, they wanted to write this record, sort of in memory of him, and so the the character, quote unquote, that the album's about, his name is Serpent Taxed. And um, most of the album is about uh, a drug-induced coma and visions that he sees while he's in this coma. And then at the end of the album, he has a, a choice as to whether or not he wants to live or, or die. Um, and, you know, he chooses death over life because of, you know the ugly state of the world and humanity basically and you know as he's passing on he the, he and they the band um and this is on track nine of the album um he sort of tries to usher a curse onto the the city in which he lived um there's some really haunting scary lyrics right in that song this is my favorite song on the record i forget the name of the song it's track nine it's called uh, i should pull up the elevators 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 yeah 
I love that song. It's the acoustic song in the album. Uh, there's more to it than that, but it's pretty interesting because all the tripped out lyrics are supposed to be visions that he's seeing in this drug induced coma. Yeah, I, I I think he um, purposely OD'd, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And then uh, went into a coma, came out of the coma, and then I don't know how long afterwards, but then he committed suicide. Yeah. Because he just and that's that's act, that's what happened to the individual, and and I guess that's how the uh, why they they wrote the the album the way they did with the the lyrics the way they did is because they literally wanted to reflect it. I think they didn't they have his diary or two or something like that that they were able to read from and write some stuff from. Or is that a different uh, album? That was that the they... next album. Next we can album. Talk about okay, yeah, I'm sorry. A little bit here. This is worth... I'm combining them. Mentioning here. Um, Deal House and the of the Mars Volta's first studio album. Our Long Tragedy takes us through the tale of a man named Serpent Tax. He attempts to kill himself by ingesting morphine and rat poison. The attempt fails and he falls into a coma for the next seven days in which he travels through the dream world of the comatorium. At the end of the seven days, he arises only to find that the world is unsatisfactory. And he, for the last time, takes his own life by jumping off a bridge. Story is based upon a friend of Cedric Bixler, Zavala, Julio Venegas. The event greatly impacted the lives of both Omar Rodriguez Lopez and Cedric and greatly influenced their music. Yeah, he, um, I know he jumped off the bridge... Um, like during traffic or something like that, like during yeah. a shower. Wow. Yeah, That's and a, that was uh, track nine as well. Is that so, your standout song, Andrew? I, I I mean, that and track, um, I think it's track three. Um, the Widow. No, no, no. no, no oh, wait, That's dares. Francis. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> yeah, the, the, Roulette Dares. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Those will be the, my two favorite tracks on that album. Um, I don't know. I just felt like it was a, a, a perfect, a, a perfect storm in the best possible way um, in terms of the way that they launched their band. You know, they did their very first album with Rick Rubin. Um, I felt like they tapped into something that both at the drive-in and Sparta failed to tap into. Um, both of those bands were kind of like post-hardcore almost. They were, uh, yeah, for sure. I thought. Uh, Relationship of Command was, you know, the best moment for At the Drive-In. Obviously, it was their best-selling album. Um, they were kind of, you know, a larger-than-life rock band rather than like a punk rock scene kind of thing. Right. They weren't really there to usher in a new style of music as much as they just wanted to actually prove their chops and, and you know, actually pushing rock forward. Just um, do their own thing. Which they did. Unfortunately, nobody really followed after. Yeah, they're not an easy act to follow. I mean, they're very unique. So that's, I think that's the reason why we're, we're doing it, though, is because they, you can't really put them in a, you know, the, the so called, you know, generic niche. I think they, they're so far, they're so over, the, all over the place that, you know, you can't really categorize them. The more you get like that with a band with me, the more I tend to, to enjoy their music. And I also like the fact that they, um, they challenge the listener. Sometimes maybe a little too much in the, in the middle albums, but I do like the fact that they that they make you think, and uh, they make you become you know have a critical ear and makes you want to go and re-listen. You know, it's just not so. It's not the generic you know straightforward crap that you hear most of the time. This is this is uh, what rock music should be. It, you know, you can tell right from the get go which band it is and. I wish there was more bands that were like that, that you, as soon as they start playing, you know immediately who you're listening to. And that's what I get when I listen to, especially on, on this one and then uh, the, the, the two latest releases. Uh, I, I think those are probably my three favorite, but I think that, and I think there's a reason behind that. It's because I think they challenge it, but they, they don't put it so far out into left field that you're completely overwhelmed. So are you guys familiar with the the artist who worked on not only this one but some of the band's other records as well? I know that there was, um, was the same artist that was doing quite a bit of the the art, but I didn't look into the actual artist. I normally do that stuff, but uh, this time around I did not. So he, his name's Storm Thorgerson, and he did a lot of the really famous Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath um a lot of other people as well peter gabriel um he's one of the most renowned um 
layout artists, you know, in rock music history, basically. Um, but he did like the Dark Side of the Moon cover. He did the Muse Absolution cover. Um, you know, he's done some of the the most recognizable um, albums. You probably don't even know that he did them. Um, now that you say right, that, I'm looking at the covers, cover and yeah, I'm thinking, <laughs> wow, that does look like Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> Just the style. They've got it. Yeah, I've always. I mean, I always noticed that they definitely had a theme. You know, uh, with with a lot of their cover artwork and layouts and things. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that doesn't surprise me at all that um, that that he's probably has done so many album covers that I have that I have that I just haven't even. <laughs> oh, he did Houses of the Holy by Led Zeppelin. Oh, okay, which is that scary image of that like rock mountain with those naked children crawling up it. Yeah, it's got a very like Cthulhu type. <laughs> Of <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. creepy. As, yeah, yeah. There's a. I mean, he's done so many cool things. At any rate, you know they. The fact that they had him do their cover art, you know, totally made sense because of the bands that they were trying to, or that they were kind of influenced by. But um, I just love this this package. Yeah, I love the layout. Um, just you know the imagery. I love art that doesn't have a definitive like answer. You know, it more is meant to provoke questions. I mean, whether we're talking music or like visual art. Um, and so, and looking at this guy's work, you know, just with all really all the album covers that he did over the years. I mean, he died a few years ago, but uh, it's just striking. You know what I mean? It's something you have to, you go, whoa, when you see it. Um, I always feel like that's the, that's the sign of a good album cover is when you, you look at it, that you have like a visceral reaction. Um, And there's not a lot of album covers out there or that have come out really at all over the decades that do that. You know, they're rare. Um, but I felt like the album art was worthy of the music. Oh yeah, for sure. I just got the uh, vinyl version of it, and uh, I need and that, to get. Th- yeah, because I mean, just just having it that big in front of you, you know. I mean, hell, you could you could frame it on your wall, you know. It, it's just uh, except for I'd want to frame like literally every panel, you know. <laughs> and yeah, uh, because it's not just about the cover. There are so many other, you know, really good looking pieces in in that whole layout and I felt like Francis the Mute was as good if not better like just those guys sitting in cars with those hoods over their heads yeah it's like it's really creepy and just very visually striking I mean red hoods a lot of color contrast you know it's just uh, it really it really grabs your eyes you know totally totally so I mean I can I can talk forever about you know, um, <laughs> on this particular album, um, but I feel like we should talk about. I mean, it's up to you guys how you want to frame this, but um, you know, Francis the Mute for me was like the most anticipated follow-up record for a really long time. Oh yeah, like two years, something like that. Like it was a uh, every every minute. You know, I remember because uh, I was actually really excited about Francis the Mute when it came out. Um, it was one of those like counting down the days kind of kind of deals and. Uh, you know, when I finally got it in my hands, I was just kind of like, "Wow, yeah, this uh, this delivers." I remember music. Well, it delivered definitely. You know, from the art, for sure, and the lyrics were cool, and just everything about it was cool. Uh, I remember getting being a little angry that like there was so much uh, so much interlude, um, but you know, because at that point, I mean, I'm still listening to like really straight ahead two and a half three minute songs you know ten in, in ten songs quick succession and that's just they're just they weren't interested in that you know <laughs> that was not a that was not a mars volta uh mindset uh, at least not until they did the most recent album they did and um yeah i remember i remember francis mute just being like one of those records that for the longest time i would put it on and i would show it to people and it was one of the first times where people were just like weren't really into it and i couldn't figure out why <laughs> like i'm looking at him she's like oh no this is great and they're just like 
Yeah, so like, when, is this, when does the track start? I'm like, dude, just... <laughs> Did, <laughs> just didn't chilling. I tell you the first time you played this for me in the car, what, is this the new Cap- Captain Beefheart? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, something like that. It's something weird like that. Yeah, I, I mean, to be honest, I was a little disappointed in Francis the Mute. Um, again, this is this is kind of like a lesson for for any dudes in bands about the, the importance of a producer and the producer's job. So my experience in, in playing in a band and as an artist is that the, a good producer comes in and he makes, you know, the wackiest stuff and song arrangements and melodies palatable, right? He's supposed to kind of, you know, make the drummer, you know, not be a distraction and hone in your, you know, your melodies and, and all the parts to make it function together as a whole. So it's palatable, it's listenable, it's sellable. You know, that's the whole point of the record producers. You know, that the label pays a bunch of money and hires this producer to help take these artists' vision and make it sellable to the masses, right? Um, and so, Francis the Mute, I mean, almost in... Um, Spinal tapping, <laughs> yeah, right. Is is a lesson in uh, a band without a producer, right? Yeah, because they produce this one themselves, right? I think it was all. Exactly. I think it, and, yeah. And the guitarist is the one. Omar is the one that is the band producer, right? Moving forward, and get me started on guitarists. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the, 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 this is again almost spinal tapping cliche because it's like. You know, the guitarist who wants to upstage the lead singer. <laughs> you got like literally the two biggest egos that you could possibly yeah. have going to war with each other, and that's what that's what Francis the Mute sounds like. I mean, um, and I you know I think initially like my one of my biggest things is like I didn't really have anything like it, you know, except for uh, the previous album. So it was one of those I really loved it because it was so crazy. And I think sometimes whenever you anticipate a record coming out for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, it's good no matter what, <laughs> you know, well, in, in your mind, you, want, you know. You want to like it. And I remember having those kinds of feelings as well. Well, they And they released um, The Widow before the album dropped. And that's a good song. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know I mean, it sounded like it could have been another track on d but it was like almost a little bit better because it was... I mean, that chorus is so palatable, you know, um, unfortunately there's no other moments like that on the whole record. Right. They do it <laughs> once. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there are so many great parts on the album, but it's like, I mean, this is a band who, you know, limitless ability and talent and vision, um, who's just saying, uh, we're just going to write a record that has no choruses because, we feel like it because we just put out this really poppy album. And so now we're going to go the other direction just because we feel like it as a response to, Oh, we're not going to do this pop garbage. Yeah. Cause we're cool we're, guys. We're yeah. Really, really express ourselves. So, and you can hear that, you know, but when, when they're popping on all cylinders, there are moments on Francis the mute that are as good as anything on D Laust, almost. Like the moment on the first song, uh, Bisman Cygnus, um, where they do that ridiculous drop down into the bridge, it's just like, you know, the plane landing. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. Engines, and then it goes into that really soft, um, tense just part with that amazing bass line that just repeats over and over and over. I love that moment. Uh, I love that moment. It, it gives me chills every time I listen to it. Um, but the thing that I loved about the Laos that isn't present on Francis the Mute. You kind of feel like it's a totally different band. A little bit. It's just, it doesn't punch. Like there aren't those moments where the dynamics are emphasized and the chorus comes in or you come out and into a part you know and it just it hits you you know emotionally as well as in a rocking kind of way 
there's those emotional moments here and there on Francis the Mute, but there's not, it lacks that punch where, you know, a part kicks in um, unexpectedly or a chorus just kind of comes out of nowhere. Um, I think that's a product of having nobody to rein them in. Yeah, yeah. That gets, that gets back to my original point. Right. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, it, it, if they had somebody that could just give them a little bit of structure, you know, it's not like they need a lot, but they just need a little bit of direction. And I think this could have been, you know, an amazing sophomore effort. You know, instead we get something where there's, you know, excellent moments. Like there's, uh, there's parts of, what is the third one is La Via, uh, La Vesca's or something like that. And there's like four or five minutes of that song that I just, I love. Uh, but I'm like, well, there's other parts that I'm just like, I, I, I'm lost because I don't know where to go next. And I just, I just think they needed somebody to, to rein them in. I, I, I think they challenged, I mean, I know they wanted to challenge themselves. They wanted to be able to also, you know, have some sort you know, all the creative control and then challenge their listeners. But, uh, I, I, I didn't, I didn't win. They, they beat me. I did. I, I had a hard time following on, on, on parts of this one. And, and it kind of creates a theme on the next couple albums after as well, that they're a, a little bit all over the map and yeah, they kind of lost me for yeah. the most part after that, at least for a while. Yeah, they did. Uh, they, uh, I'm, I'm right there with you. They did the exact same thing with me. I just was wondering, you know, what, what, what happened? You know, there was a, I don't know if it was ego, uh, substance abuse. Cause I know they had a lot of problems with that there in the middle. Cause I know they, they lost, uh, they, you know, people passed away because of, uh, you know, their substance abuse uh, issues that were in the band. And I, I think that's kind of what, you know, in the long run, I think, uh, you know, it, that was unfortunately, it took somebody losing their life to that, that they were close to, to, the rest of them to open their eyes it sounds it sounds like from what they've said in interviews but we can get to that one when, it, when we get down to it uh, down to the further albums but yeah this one was it was good it just you know it was a little too far uh a little too much over the map unfortunately yeah and again getting into lessons rock and roll 101 you know things that every band needs to embrace uh, the lesson here is no, no matter how great you are at what you do you always need a producer you always need someone to come in and make your vision consumable otherwise you get uh you know 15 minute jam sessions that don't necessarily go anywhere um you know the reason why it kind of still worked for them um is because they're that they were that good right (laughs) yeah you know um but I heard a lot of comparisons around that time um, when they would do media and press between them and Led Zeppelin. Yeah, um, yeah. The thing that Led Zeppelin always had is that there, no matter how much they would jam, you know, it's still, you know, it was still commercial. You know, the songs were still commercial. And the live show would be this experimental thing, right? Be but the love it would that, still yeah. sing along a bowl. You know what I mean? And right. That was the thing that they sort of abandoned, um, except for the widow um, on that second album. Um, not a total disappointment, but uh, definitely some, you know, somewhat compared to Deloused, which was a career-defining album. It was an album of a generation, I think. Um, as far as like rock music goes. Yeah, and it still sounds new. I mean, what, 14 years later, 13 years later? Yeah, that was what, 2003? Yeah, like, it, like it, yeah. you know, like you said earlier, it could drop now and I think still have the same, you know, probably not the same sales, but at least the same <laughs> impact. But people don't buy music anymore. No, no, we stream music. You know, like, that's a. Uh, I was just sitting here biting my fist, trying really hard not to laugh because. My only question I could think of, Andrew, was did you feel the same way about a producer while you were recording Truthless Heroes? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> wow, Joe. What did you just ask that question? <laughs> I, 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 find, I found it to be an interesting point based oh, on what was in the book. Our relationship with Truthless Heroes and you know producers was interesting because we were originally supposed to work with uh, Garth, who did our second record, Drawing Black Lines, but due to some label politics, um, 
that we found out about after the fact. Basically, our A&R guy had put us in the studio with him to write some songs following Drawing Black Lines to try to sort of stimulate a relaunch of that album and get Atlantic a little bit more behind it. Put us in the studio with him to write some songs for a film soundtrack. And then because we didn't write a huge radio hit during that session, although we did write Spy Hunter, um, <laughs> he never paid him for the recording. Awesome. So kind of wow. <laughs> you know, jacked over the producers. So we were taking meetings going into, you know, producer meetings going into Truth the Heroes. And in our brain, we were recording with Garth again because, he, you know, that was good chemistry there. And our plan, you know, he and us was to work together on that album and record it at Sound City in Van Nuys, which is where so many famous records were made. You know, I don't know if you guys have seen that film, Sound City. Have you? Yes, I have. Yeah. That um, yeah, was very so cool. Half the guys that are in that in that film, like Nick Raskolinix, like he was involved with Truthless Heroes. So, wow. Uh, he did some of the demos for us on that album, and he was set up to engineer. Um, well, let me back up. So, originally, we we're supposed to do it with Garth at Sound City. And then our NR guy um, kind of dishonestly steered us away from working with Garth, knowing in the back of his mind that we were not going to hire him because he never paid him for that recording. Right. Then we were scheduled to work with Dave Sardi, who had done a bunch of albums that we had loved around that time. Right. He did Marilyn Manson and... um, Oh gosh, tons of records that we just really liked and that sounded cool. So we were scheduled to work with him, and then our AR guy fired him because he didn't get along with his manager. Um, <laughs> and so our our third choice was just kind of in passing suggestion hey, why don't we do it with this guy, Matt Hyde, um, who was recording Slayer or somebody at the time. And we met with him in the studio and really hit it off with him got along with him really well showed him demos and he really dug the music and it's like yeah well, you know had a lot of input and ideas on how to you know approach songs etc um so we ended up working with him and nick Raskolinix was supposed to be the engineer because he had done some of our demos and this other guy who ended up being a really successful pop producer this guy named mike busby did some of our other um, demo. So all these like big name people associated with that record. So at any rate, we were in our recording. We had a little space that the label paid for that we we built a studio as, but basically a rehearsal space. But it was nice. We had air conditioning and you know fridge and TV and the whole setup. Uh, we were at our space doing pre-production for Truth of Heroes with Matt and uh, Nick, and Nick got a call from Dave Grohl who said, uh, hey, do you want to produce our new record, Foo Fighters? you got to say yes. I mean, yes. That's right. <laughs> and he's like, man, let me get back to you. I'm committed to this other project. And so he gets off the phone, and Nick says, oh, Dave says hi, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And uh, he's like, look, guys, I'm not going to do it if you don't say it's cool. Right. Um, I already committed to do your record. I'm not going to just bail on you because I got you know a cooler opportunity or whatever. And we all looked at him and said, you got to do it, dude. Right. You, you have to do that record. And that ended up winning a Grammy. Um, and that was um, one by one. Okay. One wow. Record. Um, so but he would come into the studio while we were working on Truthless Heroes and show us like rough mixes of songs. So we actually heard that whole album well before it was even mixed. Oh, very cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that was pretty cool. But getting back to your original question, um, what do you mean? Oh, <laughs> well, I guess Producer, in terms of Truthless Heroes, like that's an unpalatable record, or it needed to be reined in. I meant that based on the writing in your book, uh, you seemed a little dissatisfied with the way he was trying to steal, steer your vocals. Um, it wasn't really just the vocals; it was the entire process was overwrought, overthought, and not fun. Um, because we had sold enough records, we'd sold a good amount of records on Drawing Black Lines, which is a record we made in a really short amount of time. Um, we all knew what kind of record we wanted to write, and we were excited. We were all on the same page. 
Um, so we did it, we did it fast, and we had fun doing it. Um, I'm actually writing uh, an entry in it, uh, as we speak, not literally as we speak, but before I hopped on the podcast, um, I was working on an entry for our Pledge Music campaign, just telling some stories about making Drawing Black Lines um, as a part of kind of like an extended journal I'm doing. Very cool. Um, That's awesome. Those people are part of that. Um, if you want to check it out, pledgemusic.com slash project86. Sweet, yeah. Anyway, uh, we just made this record that was really fun, and it was a really good record the way it came out and uh, connected with people really well. Um, it was just it was a good record and so we had a lot of hype going into our third record and anytime you have some momentum all these people come out of the woodwork who want to be involved and be in control and take a slice of the pie and all that stuff so you know we went with we went from being on just an indie label tooth and nail and really not getting much attention over this because their whole staff was basically hipster type people who weren't interested in the kind of music that we were making which was fine because we weren't making music for hipsters but went from that to drawn black lines getting picked up by a major and them licensing it and then on truth of heroes being just on atlantic and so once they got involved with the process our management our a and r like everybody was speaking into the process and like we had to write for 18 months and all they cared about was radio singles and it was like hand us melodic songs that are radio friendly or you know we're not going to put out your record or Jeez. we're not going to you know buy you out of your contract or so there's a lot of pressure and it it was a lot of pressure to write a different kind of music a different style of music we we're supposed to be writing this commercial rock record and really my heart was with doing something heavier like I wanted to go as heavy or heavier than drawing black lines, but no one in our camp wanted to do that. Right. The band, the management, the ANR. It was like this band that I had started was being sort of pulled away. So I'm giving you guys kind of a long and long winded <laughs> answer here, but it sort of ties in. So uh, Rock 101, right? We're talking about that. Truthless Heroes was a victim of the opposite, overproduction. Overproduction being overthought. And my sort of response to that within the process was trying to, to create um, something I could artistically and creatively control and get into and put my passion into by trying to do this whole like Truthless Heroes thing. Right. Um, which is a conceptual element to the record. Not unlike the Mars Volta, because all of their records were conceptual as well. Um, but it became a not seeing the forest for the trees kind of thing, where it was like everything was so overthought. And for me, like I had retreated into this sort of pseudo world of Truthless Heroes and that whole thing that I lost sight of just writing s songs that people connected with you know and songs that were um just fun heavy songs that people could yell along with you know what i'm saying yeah right. for sure even within that like we i know i did i lost sight of those bigger picture things and we didn't even put spy hunter on that record like we recorded spy hunter for truthless heroes and cut it from the album because it didn't fit into the theme or it wasn't one of these newer more radio friendly songs you know what i mean i'll tell you what i actually have that record that song cut i've got spy hunter cut so whenever i listen to it on like my computer i listen to it on my um, on my phone spy hunter opens that record <laughs> and it totally well, changes the vibe that is really interesting that you say that it's because my yeah, you gotta have some regrets, right? Or things that you would do over. Sure. My biggest career question or regret or what was he thinking thing when looking back at myself, you know, two thousand one, two thousand two self, is why didn't you put Spy Hunter on the record and what would have happened if we would have led with that? But just put that song first. And so if the if Truthless Heroes opened with the Spy Hunter Track two was 
hollow again. Oh yeah, okay. Um, or even track three was hollow again. Um, and then we just loaded the front of the album with the best songs instead of spreading them out like in this conceptual stupidity. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? <laughs> sure. Um, like Spy Hunter, SMC, and then Hollow Again, Your Heroes Are Dead, and then Another Boredom Movement, and then Last Meal. Boom. That's a good record. Right. Yeah. Cut. We're done. Yep. And the answers were all there in front of us. We just needed to move the pieces around a little bit, and the whole story behind that record would have been totally different. The fans would have loved it because Spy Hunter was a hit song to our fans. We would have sold more records when the album dropped, and then Atlantic would have probably gotten behind it more, and it probably would have outsold Drawing Black Lines. But because we couldn't see the forest for the trees because of overthinking, overproduction, putting it back into the context of our Mars Volta discussion, it's like you can overproduce a record, and that you can underproduce a record. Um, the underproduction is like when you've got just the artists, you know, jamming for 15 minutes. The overproduction is when everything is overthought, the life is squeezed out of it, the mix, the noise, the sounds, you know, the arrangements, the melodies, everything is just, there's no life in it. You know what I mean? And. I feel like Drawing Black Lines is in the middle, and that's why that record did well. Um, not meaning to steer all this to project, but you guys asked. Oh, don't worry. We will. <laughs> don't worry. We, we will before we get you off the line. But uh... You may have actually just answered my next question because you brought it up on DeLoust and Francis the Mute that the album covers, you like the fact that they make you ask questions and they don't explain anything. Yeah. That style of art, and I know you know you do graphic design. I consider you a, an expert in this field. Therefore, I feel as though you can answer this question: How do you tell the difference between art for art's sake and art that actually has depth that doesn't answer anything? Um, rephrase that again. Art for how? How do you tell the difference between? being artistic for art's sake or actually being artistic. If I were to cut a bunch of things out of a newspaper and throw them on the table and say, I'm not going to tell you what it means. I'm just throwing random stuff at the ground and somebody will find meaning in it versus here's an actual piece that forces you to ask questions and I just don't explain it. I don't know. It's just that that reaction and... You know, it's not necessarily something you can explain. Um, it's just something that strikes a chord with you and with people. You know what I mean? Like, you could show anyone that cover, or really any any of Storm Thorgerson's album covers, and they're going to have a reaction to it. Right. You know? um, and they don't necessarily give answers. It's just more of a feeling and just like, what does that mean? What is that? What is that trying to say? I love that. I feel the same way about all the classic Blue Note jazz records. Just the way those pictures were shot and the way the colors were strange. Yeah. I can't really tell you why they put me in a good mood to listen to jazz, but it's like, okay, now I'm listening to jazz. Yeah. <laughs> and my brother just laughed at me for mentioning jazz on no, a, an episode uh, about, about Mars Volta. <laughs> that's, hey, you know what? It's not, a, it's not that far off base. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think no matter what the art form is, it's important that it, it evokes an emotion, so... If that's what it get, you know makes you happy, then go with it. Yeah, I like you know art in general that um, meets me where I'm at at the time, right? So if I'm going through some sort of you know uh, frustration, you know, seeing something or hearing something that uh, the artist is communicating a similar parallel experience in the human condition makes you feel like you're not alone in the universe. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's that's the power of music. That's the power of art in general is is to validate what you're experiencing and knowing that somebody else has gone through something similar and that person is also talented and put that in the form of art that 
sounds cool or looks cool, you know, and, and uh, gets an emotional reaction out of you. So like a form of commiseration. Yeah, man. Cool. So did you, have you listened to, to much of anything on the, uh, the, the third album, which I guess I should make an attempt to amputexture. Yeah. Amputexture. Yeah. Yeah. Amputexture mostly is unlistenable except for viscera eyes, which is an amazing song. It has such a cool riff and just the way that the horns mix and it sort of makes sense like that was one thing that they did at times is they would use horns and it still sounded like a rock band not like a i don't know ska band or something you know right we um we actually recently did a uh, uh a discography on swallow the sun they and they use horns and and you know unusual stringed instruments and they're like a doom metal band but what a great band name, by the way. They're one of my top ten favorite band names is Swallow the Sun. Really? Well, you know why we did it was because of the eclipse. We recorded it. <laughs> yeah, because we're, yeah, yeah, we're right, we're right at, we were, where we're located at, we're a little south of St. Louis, so we were right in the path of totality uh, right. for, for a couple of minutes. So Which just cool. Oh, uh, it was it was wild. Uh, it was It's one of the craziest things I've ever seen in my life. The, uh, the coolest thing, I think, is uh, I think they call it Shadow Snakes. Mm-hmm. Right, it's right before and right after the eclipse, ha- uh, total eclipse happens. You see like these crazy snake like wave lines uh, across the earth, like and you can only see wow. them at, like uh, uh, whenever you're right next to the ground. You can't see them up high, and it's the wildest thing that you've ever seen. It, it almost looks That's like cool. uh, it literally like sidewinders, the sidewinder snakes, just like just thousands of them going crazy all at the same time. But it's Sorry. actually. It's Oh, it's so cool. Well, they're, we're going to be ha- there's what in is it 2021? I think there's another one that's coming through the U.S. It's going to be in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's only four years off. It's not that far. All right. Hopefully, I'm alive still. I think I will be. You're going to be alive, I'm sure. <laughs> I expect I expect three to four more records. So no. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got to finish this one first. Right. Oops, I know. We are almost done. We are uh, cool. anticipating. <laughs> we uh well yeah so can we all agree collectively in the you know um as 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 the as the four of us that amputexture is i mean unlistenable not, it's yeah just it's out really not field. yeah like it was it was the last Mar- mars volta album i bought and i think i sold it maybe like a month later that was after like probably 50 or 60 purchase justification listens and then i was just like I can't <laughs> I can't do this anymore cuz like it was one of those things that I, I really thought too that it was some kind of really high level concept that just I didn't get like I just wasn't smart enough to <laughs> to really understand it but you know music music being emotional kind of an emotional thing for me it, it really if I'm not getting an emotional connection out of it it really doesn't matter how great it is or how technically played it is if I don't feel it, I just don't feel it. And on that record, I just really didn't feel anything. Yeah, and they really lost my attention at that point. Besides Viscera Eyes, which is a great song. Right. Yeah, and that's the shame is that it's it's so it, you know it's so deep in the tracks that if you're somebody like me, I listen cover to cover. That's how, that's my listening style. I mean, I was I was lost by the time I already got there. <laughs> so I was just like, yeah, uh, okay. I mean, and I couldn't even. Even if it is a good song, uh, I don't remember it because it was it, it was difficult to 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 get to that point. And I just I, I think I listen. I think I've listened to this album in the single digits. I, I don't even think I'm in double digits on this album. And just because I just I tried and gave up pretty quickly. I was like, yeah, this is just way way all it's too much over the place i'm like i I, and the first thought that came into my head was like how high were these guys when they were making this music that was the first thing and i I was like i i'm like maybe you know i don't that's not my kind of scene but maybe if i ask somebody you know that that likes to you know trip or something while they listen to the music they told you know they totally get the album because it's like it makes no sense to me at all but I don't know. I don't know anybody that I've talked to that 
got this album you know maybe like you said like a, a track or two that people enjoyed but as a collective whole this album is just so far out in left field it's just you can't follow it yeah and that's all that really needs to be said <laughs> yeah i i think that the majority of people that Moving listen to next. mars volta yeah. <laughs> are gonna say don't listen to that record listen to the bedlam and goliath yeah it's better i mean there's still a little bit of we, yeah it's still out there but it, it's they're they're not quite as far out there <laughs> as they were on the previous release, but yeah, the the Bedlam and Goliath. I think Goliath is maybe my favorite song on here, but it's still plenty weird. It, the vocals are really strange on this one. Yeah, he did a lot of lower vocals on that record, and it just the thing that makes his voice cool is the fact that he sings so high. Right. Yeah. You know, and yeah, I. Same, same for this one. <laughs> I, got, I got, I got nothing. I mean, because I knew like we were going to spend a lot of time on the first two records, and then it was just going to be like skip. Well, maybe I've listened to this <laughs> one more than anybody else. Uh, uh, what is it, Oliana? That's another one I really, really, I, I really like that song actually. But I don't know what it is. I maybe I'm the only one that likes this uh, this album. See, I feel like on the last record they just embraced the idea of we're no longer a progressive rock band. We're a soundscape artist. <laughs> because it's it's all about like we're just gonna create sounds and it's like guys, you, Delouse was really good. <laughs> yeah, but you know everything was kind of a death rattle after that. You know, Bedlam, Octahedron, Nocturnicate. Like there were moments. You know what I mean? And I think Teflon is one of their coolest songs. Oh yeah, it's totally cool in a different way. It's like, man, if you guys would just do that. You know, if you're not going to be all crazy prog anymore and you're going to be more stripped back, just write songs like this. And, and that was the thing that made the Mars Volta so interesting, compelling to me, is that they they would give you these little tastes of what they could have done. They gave you a, a whole record of just awesome from front to back. And then tastes from that point on, but it was like they were kind of just messing with you. After everything after Delouse, where it was like, "Yeah, we could do this if we wanted to, but we don't." <laughs> but we already have your ten or twelve bucks. So, <laughs> and, how, and how much it, it makes you stop and think and go, how, "How much of that is Rick Rubin?" You know how you know all on the first one. Yeah, yeah. It had a lot to do with Rick Rubin honing them in and producing them. You know, uh, and that's why that record was what it was. The rest of these albums self-produced and that's what you get. You know what I mean? But it's, you know, it's another, another rock 101 lesson in ego because, mm -hmm. you know, that is, that's why you don't have a producer because you don't want anyone telling you how it's going to be. You know, you don't want anyone controlling your art, you know, um, and I think that's the lesson with the Mars Volta is like, no matter how great you are, you know, you still need help. You still need someone to come in who's an objective third party who will, you know, take your vision and make it palatable and make it better, you know, for people to relate to. And I think that that's the lesson of this band, but they'll always be remembered as, if for no other reason, the, the little hints of, of genius, you know, throughout a lot of chaos and weird um, and that first album, you know, that first album was one of the best albums ever made. In sure, opinion. yeah. It's rock music, especially in like the modern era, not the classic era. There are no really good modern, I mean, not that many good modern rock. <laughs> I mean, it just seems to me like ever since like what, the early 90s, everything is kind of just a version of that is kind of yeah. what I've, is kind of what I've seen. Um, the 90s were definitely the last kind of great golden era, golden era of rock music. You know, my opinion, almost all of the 90s. But it's been a slow, gradual descent since then, and now it's death. <laughs> Absolutely. We had that little resurgence there for a while with Wolf Mother and, to some people, the White Stripes. But that was more leading into the noise and indie rock sound than it was about necessarily being great rock music right well there's a lot of recapturing out there that people try to do that's the word we want to recapture an era of rock music and that's not really the same thing as being like a new rock band exactly 
gentlemen i need to wrap all Absolutely. right thank you for being on yeah man i just wanted to say thanks to everybody for listening thanks for having me for sure um, great to chat with you guys and nerd out a little bit about one of my favorite bands um i could probably do another hour and talk about different lessons life lessons rock and roll lessons to be cleaned from the mars volta but we got a good overview of their career primarily focused on their early career <laughs> yeah the best part of that's how us, us music yeah. elitists like it so <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming on right, we yeah, appreciate it very thanks much. so much man we appreciate the it door is always open anytime Just keep supporting my art <laughs> oh we will we will oh we will we have and we will <laughs> so have a good night man great chatting with you this has been episode 28 of discography discussion Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, iTunes, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please send questions and comments to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal. We have some sweet perks. You can find Andrew Schwab and everything Project 86 at project86.com and andrewschwab.com. Huge thank you goes out to Andrew Schwab for hanging out with us and talking about the Mars Volta. We had a blast and we will see you in the future. No matter how many times we catch you plotting murder.